Well, thanks everyone for waiting so patiently. Um, it's lovely to see everyone here, thank you. Um, my name is Persephone Pearl. I'm a co-director at Onca, which is an art and environment organization in Brighton, England. Um, I'm just gonna give a brief description of myself um, for accessibility because um, we'll be recording this and sharing it later. Um, I'm a woman uh, in my 40s with white skin, short brown hair, and um, I'm in my office, picture of a bird on the wall, and I'm wearing a green jacket. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and there's a little dog snuffling at my feet. So that's me. Um, I just, uh, yeah, so we're streaming this event to Facebook so that there's plenty of opportunities for people to see it later if they miss it. Um, thanks for being here. Um, there's lots of supporters here from Bolivia and the USA and internationally, as well as um, from the UK, which is really um, wonderful and exciting um, to see. And I think it's because uh, the Puma years um, uh, is a big deal for many people. Um, and the sanctuaries at Comunidad Inti Yasi have many devoted fans. Um, in fact, you're, you're looking at <laughs> four of them. Um, uh, Communi Comunidad Intiwara Yasi, which we'll also refer to as Siwi in this event, um, uh, rescues, rehabilitates and cares for wild animals that have been seized from illegal trafficking. And it fights to end the animal trade through educational programs, research projects and public actions. So Laura's written about Siwi and um, Siwi is a big deal for us in Onca, at Onca in Brighton too. Um, and that's partly because Laura Coleman, the, the author that you're about to meet tonight, um, who's, uh, she, uh, she founded Onca um, and wouldn't have done that if it hadn't been um, for the experiences that she had in the Bolivian forest. And she wouldn't have set up Onca if she hadn't met Waira at Siwi. And actually our name, Onca, is the uh, scientific name for a jaguar or a puma. So, so the story that you'll be hearing about tonight is in a way Onka's origin story. So we're super thrilled. I'm super happy to be here helping to host this event and celebrate this publication. Uh, briefly, the structure for the event will be, the first half will be a conversation between Laura Coleman and Nana Baltazar, who's the CWE co-founder and president um, and is now an honorary patron of Onka. Um, Nana is at one of the sanctuaries in Bolivia and they will be speaking Spanish and John Cassidy will translate. Sarah Hannes is uh, also here. John and Sarah are, uh, are the interpreting team. John's the primary interpreter with Sarah here as backup. They're both devoted long-term friends and allies of Siwi who sort of raise its profile and raise funds for it internationally. So this is uh, very generous of you to support us. John and Sarah, thank you. Then after that conversation, there'll be a short comfort break and then we'll have a reading from the book by Laura and then a conversation between Laura and myself about the book and then hopefully time for a few uh, questions from the audience. Before I hand over to um, Laura and Nana, I just want to um, introduce you to the uh, interpretation um, tool on Zoom. It's um, going to be necessary in the next section of the event. If you look at the bar on the bottom of your screen, you'll see a globe and um, that says interpretation. I'm going to I'm going to sort of activate John as the interpreter now, and you're gonna you're going to click on if you want to hear English instead of Nana's Spanish, you're going to click on English. Now, so I hope that that's clear for you. Feel free to message me if there's any issues. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Laura Coleman, the author, this evening. Thank you, Persephone. Um, yeah, thank you, everybody, for coming. So many people coming and supporting the book and supporting Siwi. Um, so I am a woman. Um, I have white skin. I'm in my late 30s. I'm sitting in my kitchen, um, I have short brown hair and I'm wearing hoop gold earrings. 
Um, behind me is are some uh, cream blinds with blue flowers on them and a spice rack. Um, and I also have a dog sleeping at my feet. Um, so uh, before we get to the questions, I'm going to pass over to Nana um, uh, so that she can introduce herself as well. Oh, and my pronouns are she, her. So, Nana? Hola, Laurita. ¿Puedes introducir a ti? Claro que sí. Bueno, soy, ne soy Nena, eh, estoy en medio de la selva chapareña en Bolivia, en Cochabamba, en el corazón de Sudamérica. Estoy al frente de un mono araña y de tres monos capuchinos. Estoy sobre un techo de carpa porque hoy amaneció lloviendo. Soy una chica eh, de tez morena, eh, el pelo rizado. Tengo ahora mismo puesto eh, mi gorra, que es, siempre la llevo conmigo. Tengo y tengo una, una polera azul. Y estoy muy emocionada de poder compartir contigo, Laura, Laura en la presentación de tu libro. Great. Thank you so much, Nina, for being here. It's, it's incredible to have you here and to have your support of the book. Um, so hopefully this will be a great opportunity um, for um, yeah, us to chat a little bit about Siwi. Um, I'm going to kick off with the first question. So what I want to talk about is the book um, is essentially about my experience in Bolivia, in the sanctuaries, um, and with a puma, Waira. I was a young person when I first went to <coughs> was doing something completely out of my comfort zone and you must have had a similar experience when you left the city La Paz and set up Bolivia's first ever sanctuary for rescued wild animals which was Parque Machia in your early 20s. So I was wondering if you can tell us um, why you did it and how you felt as a young person taking on such an unorthodox life. Yeah. Mm. Bueno, eh, Inti Guarayasi nació eh, con, con niños en el Alto de la Paz. Con estos niños hacíamos diferentes actividades para mostrarles un poco de la naturaleza y también en la defensa del medio ambiente. Y poco a poco con estos niños fuimos eh, involucrándonos en la defensa de los derechos de los animales. Y en, en todos estos años eh, me tocó rescatar un mono araña que estaba, de, vivía en una casa maltratado, estaba vivía de mascota, vivía en una jaula de un metro por un, por un metro y medio, compartí esta jaulita con un, con un loro. De casualidad, el mono se llamaba Nena, como yo. Entonces la rescaté y esos años en, en Bolivia no había un refugio, un refugio donde yo pueda eh, llevarla para que puedan eh, cuidarla. Entonces, ni tampoco podía tenerla en mi casa. Entonces, estuve varios meses caminando, buscando un lugar donde poder dejarla. Y en esos meses descubrí, entendí que los animales tienen emociones muy fuertes, sentimientos y que pueden eh, sentir dolor, alegría, tristeza y que tienen una habilidad increíble de poder comunicarse con nosotros a través de su mirada. Y eso es lo que me pasó. Eh, yo estaba estudiante de biología, dependía de mis padres, entonces no podía tener más a nena conmigo. Tomé la decisión de llevarla a un zoológico en La Paz. Y el momento, la noche que toma, tomé esa decisión, al día siguiente quería tomar a nena conmigo para llevarla. Ella me miró fijamente a, a mis ojos. Y era como si a través de esa mirada me decía, no me abandones, no me dejes. Entonces no pude resistirme a esa mirada, ¿ya? Y te digo, eso llegó a lo más profundo de mi ser y es ahí donde tomé la decisión. Dije, bueno, nena, ya no sé qué va a pasar, pero no te voy a abandonar. Y nena me dio una respuesta, uh, un sonido, el típico de los monos arañas que están felices, ¿no? A partir de ese momento se me dio la oportunidad de venirme al Chapare, al igual que tú, Laurita, Dije, Chapare, Villatunari, ¿dónde es? No conocía, no tenía idea dónde estaba. Y, y tenía miedo, tenía miedo qué hacer, pero tenía que emprender este viaje porque era la única forma de poder darle una segunda oportunidad en su selva 
a la mona, araña, ¿no? Y es así que tomé mi mochila, llena de cargada de sueños, de ilusiones, me vine en un camión con otros cuatro monos, porque mis otros compañeros también habían rescatado, Vin vinimos a Machía y llegamos acá a una tierra desconocida, eh, no tenía dinero, no tenía idea de nada, de dónde estaba, ya, y, pero te digo, eh, el amor, el amor por esta mona araña es que me ha, me ha impulsado para venir acá al Chapare y poder fundar el primer refugio de animales silvestres en Bolivia. Digo, muy jovencita, eh, tal vez mi familia quería algo diferente para mí, que me case, que tenga hijos o que sea una profesional, pero bueno, creo que mi vida ha cambiado de, de rumbo, ¿no? Y desde ese momento estoy al pie luchando por los animales, y no solo por nena, sino por muchos otros más que poco a poco han ido llegando, otros monos, después un puma, y wow, te digo, es, es algo increíble. Y los animales son seres maravillosos que, que te roban el corazón y hacen que te quedes acá en los parques, como ha ocurrido contigo, que ha sido eh, tu primer viaje, eh, no sabías dónde, qué te estaba esperando y te esperaba Guaira para enamorarte y bueno, ese amor que, 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 no, que tenemos es lo que hace que estemos aquí en los parques y que tú también hayas vuelto aguantando, soportando las condiciones difíciles que nos toca vivir en la selva. Pero el amor, la pasión por estos animales es que estamos acá. Thank you, Nina. That's so be such a beautiful story. I remember when you told it to me for the first time in the jungle and it just, yeah, it's amazing. Um, so yeah, kind of leading on from that, I guess um, uh, I wanted to talk about volunteering and how, well, the Pew and is, is largely about my experience as a volunteer. So as CWE has, has grown and evolved, it's shaped itself around kind of the model of volunteering Although in the last year, this has proved itself to be pretty unsustainable due to the pandemic. I was wondering if you can talk about the importance of volunteering to CWE um, and what ways you see this potentially changing in the future. CWE, eh, eh, bueno, desde sus inicios, como le decía, eh, ha apoyado a niños en estado vulnerable. Y, con ellos hemos, eh, sí, voy a, ha tratado Nena. siempre de continuar el trabajo Nena. con los niños. Nena, ¿Ya? espera un poco. Sarah, can you translate that because of time, I've switched to the third question. Okay, Nena, porque no tenemos tanto tiempo, eh, Laura cambió a la tercera pregunta. Okay, no me salió. Eh, que eh, sobre la Voluntarios. Voluntaria, sí. Ya. Lo siento, nena. <risas> no, no hay problema, no hay problema. Ya. Eh, para para Inti Guaray, así el, el, los voluntarios son el pilar, el pilar. Eh, desde nuestra primera voluntaria, que era una suiza que llegó acá, y, son los que, y hasta el último voluntario, son los que nos han ayudado día a día para construir estos tres santuarios que tenemos: Machía, en Cochabamba, Amboarín, Guarayo, Santa Cruz y Jacuiz en el norte de La Paz. Estos voluntarios vienen de muy lejos acá para ayudarnos con en la atención, eh, limpieza, eh, cuidado de los animales. Y es un trabajo arduo, duro. Y aparte del trabajo, de la mano de obra, el esfuerzo que, que, da, que hacen estos voluntarios, también nos ayudan económicamente porque Intihuareya sí se mantiene gracias al apoyo, a la, a la, a la, al aporte económico que, que estos voluntarios dejan. Entonces, para nosotros... Es, es, es muy importante y más que todo el mensaje que llevan estos voluntarios a todas partes eh, del mundo de la importancia que aquí en Bolivia hay jóvenes que estamos luchando, cuidando para proteger la fauna silvestre. Sí. Yeah. That's that's great, and I think I'm actually going to skip back to this to the last question because I think it's really important. Um, so I'll ask it, and then maybe Sarah, you can just translate that for um, Nana. Um, so yeah, so it kind of leads on. 
I guess in the UK, it's often thought that environmental and social issues are separate from each other. But see we um, with um, your work with, with people shows a different way. Um, uh, and what can you tell us a bit why it's so important to you that CUE works with uh, young people? Um, ¿Me puedes traducir, por favor, Laura? Sí, Sarah, can you? Yeah, uh, Nina, Laura decidió regresar a la segunda pregunta. Porque pienso que es muy importante. Porque ella sí, ella <laughs> pensaba que es muy importante. Do you need me to translate the question? Um, ya, yeah. el trabajo con los niños, entendí esto, ¿no? Sí, claro. Sí. Ya. Yeah. Bueno, es para eh, Siwi ha empezado con niños apoyando en estado vulnerable. Hemos hecho en todos estos años en Hemos tratado de mantener este, este trabajo de apoyo a los niños. ¿Por qué? Porque es importante generar conciencia, educar, fomentar a estos niños el respeto a, la, a los animales, a la fauna silvestre y a los bosques. Eh, en los parques eh, tenemos jóvenes, niños que han, que han nacido, que, que han crecido con, con Intihuarayasi. En el caso, por ejemplo, de, de Amboarí, que tenemos oso. Cuando llegamos a Amborí, eh, Oso es un niño, bueno, esos años tenían 10 años, ya 10 años, llegó y vivía en una comunidad cercana que se llama Villa San Pedro, ya, y Oso se involucró con nosotros, creció junto a otros jóvenes, otros niños en Itihuarayas, y ahora es todo un, un eh, eh, que es papá, tiene dos niñas, entonces es importante para Siwi apoyar a estos jóvenes porque ellos son el futuro. Ellos dan, y también ellos han llevado el mensaje a sus padres, a sus familias, para que entiendan la, la importancia de cuidar nuestros bosques, que tengan el respeto a los bosques. Y asimismo, Siwi está trabajando en los colegios, en las escuelas aledañas a los parques, como en, en Amboarí, la escuelita de Villa San Pedro. Los voluntarios van constantemente a hacer actividades para hacer llegar, amar y también en los parques eh, ese, ha sido interesante que estos niños han crecido también conociendo voluntarios diferentes culturas y se ha hecho en sí como es una siempre decimos es una familia todos somos una familia es los animales y los humanos porque los animales necesitan necesitan de los humanos y los humanos también necesitamos de la naturaleza, de la selva, para nuestra sobrevivencia. It's definitely what it feels like working with seaweed. <laughs> um, yeah, so can you tell us a little bit, can you say what the greatest threats facing seaweed sanctuaries and the wildlife we care for today? Ya. Yeah. Constantemente tenemos amenazas, amenazas no solo para, para los santuarios que manejamos, a nivel general, eh, los bosques están cada vez reduciéndose, la deforestación, ¿no? Yo recuerdo, recuerdo Amboarí cuando compramos, era todo bosque, ya la agricultura ha crecido, la ganadería, eh, y esto ha hecho que Amboarí se, se reduzca y se vuelve, se convierte en una isla. Todo al borde de, de Amboarí está talado, no hay bosque, entonces es una isla. Eh, el tráfico de fauna silvestre, ¿no? En Bolivia hay una ley que prohíbe la, la tenencia, la matanza, el tráfico de animales, pero como en muchos países estas leyes solo, solo se quedan en papeles y no se cumplen, ¿no? Y es una pena porque cada vez siguen sacando animales de la selva. De cada 10 animales que sacan, uno llega a sobrevivir. Y de este uno, que los que llegan a los, a los santuarios llegan en muy malas condiciones, con problemas físicos, psicológicos, con heridas, que es irreversible. Las aves cortadas, sus, sus alas que nunca van a poder volar. Lo ideal 
sería que estos animales se queden en la selva y que Machía, Amboarija, Cuis y todos los santuarios, los centros que existen, que hay ahora, no existan, que no haya necesidad de que haya estos centros. ¿no? Y, y es, es, un, es algo que, que realmente la gente tiene que tomar conciencia, tiene que, que entender que al comprar un animal o al recibir un animal están siendo parte del, del tráfico de fauna. Eh, los incendios, como lo comentaba anteriormente, los incendios está cada vez peor. Eh, cada año son miles de hectáreas que se están quemando. En Bolivia, el año pasado, tuvimos un incendio fatal que se quemó miles, miles de hectáreas. Y también nos afectó a nosotros. Amboarí, Amboarí el año pasado perdimos más, casi el 50% de las 900 hectáreas que tenemos. Y fue una lucha muy dura, muy difícil. Éramos 15 personas, 15 personas eh, peleando contra, contra el fuego. El fuego se venía hacia nosotros, estaba poniendo en riesgo todos los animales que estábamos cuidando. Y ha sido, y es una amenaza constante. Ahora mismo en Amboarí, y estamos entrando a la época seca, tenemos en, eh, la poca gente que hay, tenemos que prepararnos para otra vez resistir, eh, resistir este, esta amenaza que, que es muy, muy triste, muy triste porque aparte de, de quemar árboles, mata el hogar de muchos animales y a los mismos animales. ¿no? En Machía, que estamos acá en Cochabamba, otra de las amenazas también es que eh, ya estamos acá 25 años y la mancha urbana está creciendo, eh, la carretera, el ruido y el parque se va reduciendo más y también los problemas políticos con las autoridades locales, la diferencia de, de, de ideología de, de en cuanto a los animales acá, es que también eh, se ha puesto muy difícil la situación y es que en sí ha tomado la decisión de, de mover, de cerrar Machía y movernos a, a Jacuisi. Jacuisi queda en el norte de, de La Paz, del departamento de La Paz. Eh, es un, son, tenemos 300 hectáreas, colindamos con el Parque Nacional Madidi. Es un lugar maravilloso. Y estamos moviendo estos, 20, estos eh, 25 años de trabajo, dejamos acá en Machía movemos más de 300 animales que tenemos acá y eso va a ser un, un reto bastante difícil, duro, que estamos empezando a la hora y es también gracias a, al libro de, de Puma Yers que hemos empezado a construir las primeras infraestructuras en Jacuisi que nos va a permitir llevar a los animales. Esa, este, este movimiento no va a ser inmediato, va a ser un, un meses largos porque son vidas que, que estamos cuidando acá y no es, o sea, es, es bastante duro, ¿no? Eh, pero eh, confío, confío de que, de que sí vamos a lograrlo, ¿no? Entonces, las amenazas son constantes, pero creo que ahí es importante que como personas sigamos luchando, sigamos luchando para lograr conseguir eh, el poder conservar, cuidar nuestra naturaleza, toda nuestra biodiversidad, porque al final defender la naturaleza, el planeta no es solo para uno, sino es para las presentes, futuras generaciones. Thank you, Nana. It's yeah, so heartbreaking to hear kind of all those threats being put into words. But as you say, like the thing that blows me away, kind of every time is that capacity for for hope and faith and and love of these animals um and i think that's i've tried to put that into words in the book um uh, and obviously as people who've read the book um know that it's about a particular puma called wire um and i know there are quite a few people anxious to hear how she's doing and a little bit about her so nana you were there when she first arrived in the sanctuaries. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit, tell us a memory you have of Waira when she first arrived. Mm. 
nos puede ir ya. Bueno, voy a <ríe> recordar en el tiempo. <ríe> ya. Eh, bueno, Guaira, como muchos de los animales ¿no? que llegan a, a, a los santuarios de Yuarayasi, son rescatados de, bueno, primero, en la selva vivían felices, lo que hace la gente para comercializar es mata a las madres para arrebatar a las crías y estas crías son las, las que las comercializan, ¿no? Y Guaira es una, es una víctima del, del tráfico de fauna. Eh, y Guaira, bueno, un poquito para contarles, Guaira, le puse el nombre de Guaira, que significa viento en quechua, ¿ya? Y bueno, eh, la historia de Guaira es que ella estaba, eh, vivía en Potosí, en Potosí, con un chico, con un chico que, que la tenía de mascota y que la usaba para hacer eh, su show en la calle, la manejaba, ¿ya? Entonces, eh, eh, Inti Guaraya sí tenía gente, en, tiene gente en muchos lugares, ¿ya? Para siempre estar eh, luchando, peleando por los animales. Entonces, eh, personas de Siwi denunciaron a este chico y, y esta persona se vio en la, en la que se vio obligado en realidad para traer a Guaira a Machía, ¿no? Cuando llegó Machía, bueno, no sabíamos si iba a quedarse acá o la íbamos a llevar a Ambuari. Entonces, eh, delegamos un, un espacio para ella, ya en el monte, y designamos una persona para que la cuide. Cuando estamos ahí, y un día, eh, vienen y me, me, una persona viene y me dice, nena, nena, Guaira, Guaira se escapó. Yo, wow, miércoles, ¿qué hago? Corrimos todos a buscar a Guaira. ¿Dónde está Guaira? Estábamos ahí. Y te digo, fue un, hace un tiempo de casi 10 minutos, ¿no? 10 minutos y eh, alguien en taxi viene y dice, nena, hay un taxista y dice que hay un puma en San Lorenzo. San Lorenzo es una comunidad cercana que es a 15 kilómetros más o menos. Yo decía, imposible, no creo que sea Guaira. Por si acaso mandé una persona para ir a ver qué puma era. ¿Y sabes qué pasa? Que evidentemente era Guaira. No sé cómo, pero en segundos voló, escapó por la selva. Fue como un viento fugaz que llegó en minutos en esta comunidad. ¿No? Y ahí te digo, fue un susto enorme, pero gracias a Dios que logramos recuperar a Guaira. Y bueno, y bien merecido se lo tiene el nombre de Guaira, viento. ¿no? Y bueno, después todo tranquilo, todos en paz, tranquilos con Guaira otra vez en, con nosotros. Her name is utterly perfect. <laughs> um, thank you for sharing that, Nena. Um... So finally, I mean, we have time for one more question, I think. Um, and the, I guess the most important one is how can people help? Como las personas pueden ayudarnos? Eh, pueden ayudarnos de muchas, muchas maneras. Primero, pueden venir y ser voluntarios con nosotros. ¿Ya? Lamentablemente ahora estamos muy pocas personas con lo de la pandemia que eh, nos, ha, nos ha dificultado bastante. No estamos teniendo voluntarios y las tareas de trabajo son arduas. Pueden venir siendo voluntarios, ayudarnos y especialmente en este movimiento que vamos a hacer de Machía a y vamos a necesitar mucha ayuda. Pueden venir a ayudarnos a construir, a, y si no es posible a construir, pueden venir para ayudarnos en el traslado de los animales, ¿no? Y también pueden visitar nuestra página web de Siwi, donde tenemos diferentes formas de apoyar, y una de esas es eh, el programa que tiene Siwi, Apadríname, donde pueden ser padrinos de uno de los maravillosos animales que tenemos. Así como Guaira tiene su, gracias al libro de Puma Yers, tiene su club de fans, ¿ya?, eh, hay otros animales también que esperan. Tenemos, por ejemplo, Ru, el jaguar, maravilloso que ha sido rescatado. Tenemos eh, eh, Pinad, un, un zorro. Eh, acá en Machía también tenemos monos, capuchinos, 
muchos, muchos animales que todavía esperan un padrino para ayudarlos, ¿no? Y también otra de las eh, formas de poder ayudarnos es con una donación. Este tiempo, eh, Siwi eh, ha logrado sobrevivir, ha logrado mantener todos los tres santuarios gracias a las donaciones de las personas que han aportado en todas las campañas que hemos hecho durante todo este tiempo. Todavía falta mucho más. Necesitamos de tu ayuda. Entonces, es la oportunidad. Y algo que sí también pueden ayudar es comprando este maravilloso libro de Puma Yer. Yeah. <ríe> no, que gracias, gracias a este libro, Laura, estamos logrando concretar el, eh, por fin el movimiento a, a Jacuiz. Hemos podido construir, como lo dije anteriormente, las primeras infraestructuras. Pero hay mucho, mucho más por hacer. El reto es grande. Necesitamos de, de tu ayuda. Necesitamos de la ayuda de las personas. Entonces, compra y entiende el por qué uno puede ser voluntario en Inti Warayasi, ¿no? Y bueno, y también otra de las formas es llevar el mensaje. Llevar el mensaje de la importancia de proteger, cuidar los animales. El trabajo acá en Siwi es duro, es difícil, pero es gratificante porque el día a día que damos, que entregamos a los animales, vale la pena. Estamos cambiando la vida de estos animales y tú puedes ser parte de esto, puedes venir y ayudar. Y si no puedes venir acá, ayuda, difunde el mensaje porque estos animales realmente lo necesitan. Siwi te necesita más que nunca ahora. Thank you, Nina. Um, and I think maybe, uh, Sarah, you could translate this, um, but I think on yeah, behalf of Onka and behalf of everyone, just thank you, Nina, for giving your time and being here tonight. Um, uh, I know you're super busy, um, uh, as everyone is in the parks. Um, so I was wondering, well, do you want to translate that, Sarah? Eh, sí, eh, queremos darte nuestras gracias y gratitud porque sabemos que usted es muy ocupada, está muy ocupada siempre en los parques y agradecemos mucho que, que usted estuvo aquí con nosotros esta noche. Um, and we have a few more minutes, so uh, I was wondering maybe you could, ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> bueno, estoy con, con Marucha. Marucha y yo queremos agradecerles, agradecerles por todo. Ya, yeah, estoy acá, que es una moda araña muy especial. Es mi, te digo, estos animales son mi inspiración. Y gracias, gracias, Laura, por, por haber eh, realizado este, este trabajo tan especial, tan bonito. Y, y gracias por, por mostrar el trabajo del voluntario en Siwi. Could you maybe tell us Marucha's story quickly? Nina, eh, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> La historia de Marucha. Sí. Bueno, eh, Marucha eh, fue rescatada de un, un lugar donde crían chanchos. Parece que alguien la tenía de mascota, ¿ya? Y eh, se escapó y estuvo durante varias semanas en, un, en ese lugar. Y gracias a los voluntarios de Siwi se logró rescatar. Marucha la trajeron acá a, a Machía. Llegó en muy malas condiciones. No tenía pelos, estaba llena de sarna y estaba muy desnutrida, muy flaca. Inmediatamente nuestros veterinarios la cuidaron y bueno, ahora está con nosotros. Lamentablemente ella no pudo integrarse al grupo que tenemos arriba porque es vieja. Pero bueno, vive acá con nosotros y generalmente yo estoy al tanto de ella. ¿No? Y bueno, es una mona feliz que ha logrado tener una, una mejor vida. Lamentablemente nunca va a poder ser libre por el daño que las personas le han hecho, pero al menos acá tiene la atención y el cuidado de todas las personas que estamos en Itihuarayas. Mamita. Oh, Marucha. That's lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marucha, for being here. Um, <laughs> It's so good, yes, yeah, it's been so good to see you, Nina. Um, and yeah, just thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, we, we're gonna go to a comfort break now, Persephone.
Yeah, let's take a, a short five minute comfort break. I think what I'll suggest is that we say goodbye and muchas, muchas gracias to Nena and, um, and wonderful to meet you. And, and muchas gracias to John and Sarah too. Yeah. Um, so then Nana can Nana can sign out and John and, and Sarah can take a little break and then in five minutes we'll come back and we'll hear um, a reading from the book from Laura. So I'm going to suggest that all of the panellists either sign out or we turn off our screens and microphones just for five minutes so we'll come back at quarter to seven. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, ciao, ciao. Gracias. Bye. Ciao. So yeah, I'm going to do a bit of screen sharing. Um, so yeah, um, should I say what's going to happen? No, you just go ahead. Tell us. Yeah, should I just go yeah, ahead? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'm going to start by doing a short reading. Um, it's going to be about ten minutes long, um, and during it, Persephone is going to share um, 
a few images. Um, only a few. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there was a very large selection of images. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Too many. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to read a little section. Um, it's not too far into the book. Um, it's at a moment where I've been in the park in Ambuari for about five days. I'm pretty miserable. Um, uh, I'm uh, exhausted, there's lots of mozzies, I haven't quite uh, acclimatized yet. Um, and it's a Saturday. So Saturdays um, is our day off, but I've chosen instead to go and spend the afternoon with Wyra, led by Jane, who's the volunteer who is training me on this Puma, Wyra, who uh, I don't yet understand at all. Um, Say my mum's out walking the dogs, so if there is if there are do if there are dogs barking, that's why. Wyra is sunning herself on her throne. Jane and I sit cross-legged on either side of the doorway, the cloudless sky punishing, and the compacted earth cruelly hard on my bones. I've been watching a particularly flamboyant beetle trying to bury itself for the last half hour while trying to identify why exactly I am here. Wyra is in a sunny patch in her cage and shows no interest in coming down at all. Maybe she knows it's Saturday, I say miserably, looking up at the sky, which is as blue as forget-me-nots. I cannot believe I've given up an afternoon of freedom for this. Jane turns a page of her book. It's just good to be here, she says. I stare at Wyra, who has her eyes firmly closed, so firmly closed, it makes me think that it is for our benefit. She doesn't care, I say. Jane just raises her eyebrows and says nothing. I sigh, lean my head back against the cage and return to the beetle. I can just hear the croak of a toucan somewhere to my left. Above that is the high-pitched whistle of some creature I don't know a truculent line of cacaws, the throaty conversation of a pair of macaws. Lower down is the thud of a woodpecker's beak. I think the tree is hollow, the way the noise sounds empty. Settling between this is the hiss of crickets, the whine of mosquitoes that grows higher as I grow still and they grow bolder, gyrating nearer to my ears. There is the motor of a hummingbird's wings, the rustle of leaves, the muted squeal of toads, the crunch of sticks as something burrows in the undergrowth. I think with panic that these noises will be lodged in my brain forever and I'll never be free of them. But the more I think this, the more I listen. And as I listen, with the heat cushioning my body against the cool mud and the cold metal of the cage, my mind drifts. I become dreamy the sounds less fractious, the hummingbird's wings relax, the rustling deepens, the crickets lower, the toads sink, the woodpecker slows, the macaws start to speak somewhere else. Time just passes. Silence. Suddenly, I look down at my wrist and realize I don't have my watch. For a moment, I feel panicky, but then I realize too that I don't need it. It doesn't matter. I close my eyes and let the river of jungle wash over me. I think at some point I fall asleep. Laura, what? I mumble, turning my neck with a painful groan and opening my eyes. Wyra is inches away, staring at me with apparent interest. My head has somehow migrated, my cheek now sandwiched against the fencing. I move back quickly, rubbing the indentation in my face. I murmur, unconsciously using her nickname. I'm sorry, princess. Lo siento. Wyra sniffs. Her posture is impeccable, a long line of darkness stretching from the top of her head down the graceful arch of her neck, all the way to the curved end of her tail. Around the edge of her pupils is a line of amber, sharp, as an old layer in a fossil. 
the sun falls across her fur. Jane is already threading the rope through the door, but as Wyra saunters over to lie down, Jane hesitates. Do you want to do it? She asks. Me? I squeak. Jane nods, holding the rope out to me. I stare at it in my hands, as if I don't quite understand how it has got there. It's about the width of two thumbs, the edges frayed. As I run my fingers across it, it feels soft, as if it's been held by many different people before me. Lyra stares at me, waiting. I nod. Put your arm in, Jane says. I close my eyes, take a deep breath, and try to recapture the sounds that lulled me to sleep. I let them wash over me again, the toads and their songs, the toucans with their chatter, the heavy thunk of the woodpecker's beak. I let the shadows of the palms sit across my shoulder blades and the heaviness of the air lie over my hands. I grit my teeth over my fear. Then I crouch down and slide my arm through the bars. Wyra continues to lie very still, her eyes dramatically lined with black as if she's on her way to a stage play. I'm just able to keep my hands steady. Her ears are ever so slightly back. The first time she licks me, I don't know what to do. She's licking me, I hiss. Jane laughs, crouched on the other side of the door, hugging her knees. Don't get too excited, she says. It's mostly for the salt. But Wyra haughtily butts my arm with her forehead, turning it over so that she can lick the other side. It's almost, almost possible to forget that she's in a cage, and I am not. It feels as if it should be the other way around. The jungle out here with her, us in there. It cloaks her, bottle green. Her tongue is rough, ripping. It hurts more than I thought it would, but I don't want her to stop. She's making a low noise and it sounds to my desperate, exhausted ears like acceptance. She's leaning over my arms, head down, one relaxed paw balanced up on the edge of the fence, licking, licking, licking. My skin is turning raw and the rest of me feels nothing. It's only this small spot of skin that she's touching. That's the only part of me that exists. Everything else, my whole existence before this, fades. She's spirited me away to a place where cages aren't real. I can't believe this is the same cat that hissed at me on my first day. She looks the same, but she's not. Everything is different. My head is full and I'm smiling so widely that I think for a ridiculous moment, I might burst into tears again. What's happening to me? Thank you, Wyra, I whisper. She gives a little sniff as if to tell me not to make a big deal about it. My hands are shaking now and I fumble with the carabiner. She can smell the sudden surge of alarm that makes my head hot, then blisteringly cold. But then I'm slipping the carabiner through her collar and it's closed, locked. Wyra spins with the beginnings of a savage growl I can hear the snap of her throat and the trapped snarl behind her teeth, but my hands are already out and I'm standing, breathing hard, pulling off the latch and swinging open the door. There's no acknowledgement, just a flick of her tail. And then she's ambling away as if this happens every day. For her, I suppose it does, but not for me. Wyra plonks herself down in what seems to be her favorite spot in the middle of the runner. It's a little dip of grass between tall, nimble trees with bark that smells of baked pepper and a patch of knee-high young patuhu. Wyra rolls onto her side, belly blindingly bright, and looks straight at Jane. Wilderness hangs off her. She might disappear. I'd believe it if I blinked and the rope was gone. She was gone. I make to move forwards, but I can't. The force around her pushing me backwards without my feet even moving. But Jane walks straight up to her. Wyra doesn't hiss or grumble. The wild smell fades, 
dissipates, flows, and then grows even stronger. Jane ducks her head, leans her face down, and the two of them sit cheek to cheek, forehead to forehead. I have stopped breathing. We've spent five days in the boiling heat and humidity being bitten to shit by mozzies, just so we can watch this angry, stubborn cat sleep no more than 10 minutes from her cage. I'd assumed that was it. That's what this month would be. Jane turns, flashing me a smile. You can come over. I nod, not able to speak. I look up at the flat blue of the sky. I feel upside down in a sea that should be down, not up, the clouds floating little white boats. I sit down very carefully and hold out my hand. I know Waira is watching me, so my action doesn't come as a surprise. Just with a heavy sigh, as if to say, finally, she angles herself towards me, and then she's licking. In an attempt to get near it, she gives a frustrated little grumble, puts one giant forepaw on my leg, immaculately sharpened claws, caught in the material of my jeans, and pulls. I don't look at Jane because I know she'll be smiling, but maybe I am too. With my other hand, I reach across and place it on Wyra's shoulder blade. I let it lie there, getting used to the warmth, the hardness of muscle, the softness of fur, letting her get used to me. I run my hand downwards, across her back, over her hip. I think I can feel the steady thump, thump of her heart. I can't hear anything else now. The jungle has gone and it's just this. She twists her head, her eyelashes catching in a burst of sun. I move my hand upwards, stroking until my fingers reach her neck. She's velvet. She leans towards me. She smells of the jungle floor, rain and damp mud. The light mottles making patterns against the line of her spine, the shades of her fur whenever I blink. I wonder what I smell like. Sweat and cigarette smoke, perhaps. Jane has edged away, giving us space. My breathing is slowing to match hers. She stopped licking, her strong back paws curled up in the mud, her one front paw still on the edge of my trousers, claws contracted, Toes relaxed. Her other paw is tucked under her chin. She's starting to shut her eyes, her breathing deepening. Her chest rises and falls. Her eyelashes flutter. She suddenly looks so vulnerable. I feel dizzy again, as if I'm tilting. Maybe it's the adrenaline. But it's also because I've been spinning for so long. I've felt lost in the lights and sounds and pressures of moving forwards, moving upwards, moving somewhere. The aimlessness of it making my hands shake and limbs desperately tired. I'm tired now, but it's different. Now, for the first time in a really long time, with the sound of Wyra's steady breathing and the settling of the jungle heartbeats around me, I feel like I'm weightless as if I might be coming to a stop here in a place I least expected to with this puma who I'm starting to realize might not be as brave or as bold as she wants me to believe. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's great hearing you read it. It's very moving such wonderful attention to detail that kind of devotion and that paying attention to all those tiny tiny lives and intimate details as you really like deepen into that place I love reading it I thought reading it through was going to be really traumatic but yeah well because you were scared a what reading that section or reading it in general? Oh, you mean reading the audiobook? Well, I think reading, yeah, reading it over 
I thought was going to be difficult. But yeah, I really, yeah, it's lovely to kind of go back and and have that as my memories. <laughs> you really get the sense of why, you know, you, 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 that you'd been searching and you were, there was this kind of moment of you realizing you might have arrived. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> definitely thank you do you want to um tell us a little bit about how wire is now before we get into chatting a little bit about um yes definitely um so this photo that you can see is actually um a recent photo of wire um taken by cleo Sweeson, um who's the current uh cat coordinator at uh, the park at Amborari. Um, and this is her hanging out on her new platforms. So she got platforms, um, or these new ones, uh, last at the beginning of last wet season. Um, so these are really important. I don't know if you can see, but there's um, she's got a ramp at the edge. Um, and because she's getting older, um, I had to check with Nana tonight. Um, now. Sorry. Um, Sorry. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, she's 18, so she's she's definitely getting on and she does struggle with, with her legs and with arthritis. So it's really important now that she doesn't jump too much um, and she's careful with her legs. So these platforms are great and she loves lying on them and napping in the sun. Um, at the moment, she's pretty lucky. She's got two volunteers, um, both of whom are there for a really long time. Um, so one of them is a woman who's there for six months and the other is Felipe, who's the vet, um, which again is really important that um, for older cats like Waira um, to have that kind of contact time with um, a vet every day um, or every other day is uh, really important to monitor her limp, um, to monitor um, her overall health. She gets, things, she gets UTIs quite a lot. Um, urinary tract infections, which is quite common in, in older cats. Um, so those things is just, yeah, really important to um, monitor. But overall, she's doing, she's doing pretty well. She's still wired. They told me um, a story the other day about how she was just hanging out, chilling with her volunteers um, and was having a really good day and was really happy. And then a butterfly came and just uh, flew past her nose and that like, no. Nah. <laughs> She just got up and was so pissed off and grumpy um, for the whole session after that. So she's definitely, she's still got, she's still wire. Um, but yeah, she's she's doing pretty good at the moment. Call her princess because she's princess. moody. Uh, because she's moody and she likes to be, she likes to be looked after. She likes to sit on her platforms in the sun rather than sitting in the mud. Uh, she's very picky. She has, she's, I think she's the only cat who gets, she has to have her chicken um, uh, in a separate bag so it doesn't touch any of the other meat that gets delivered. Um, and she will only eat um, uh, specific parts of the chicken. So I think at the moment, I think she's only eating the breast and the legs and she has to have it in like a, a specific order. Wow. Very picky. <laughs> I'm just aware that my dog's my dog's in a foul temper now. Sorry, I'm going to stop sharing, <clears throat> so I can ask you some questions about Princess and the mm -hmm. other denizens of um, the park and the book itself. So yeah, I really loved reading the book, um, and um, I'm sure anyone here who's who's read it too um, will uh, <clears throat> agree that. Um, one of your key kind of writing devices is is the use of humor so you kind of really bring i was laughing out loud quite a lot as i read the book uh, with some of your descriptions of yourself and the kind of the conditions at the park uh, the park so i was just wondering if you'd like to talk a little bit about about that strategy why you've used humor and 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 this kind of self self-deprecating humor that you that's your sort of trademark <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think it's weird because in real life, not in my head, um, I don't think I'm actually that funny. So uh, when people say that they they laughed at the book or like humor was a huge part of it, um, 
it's not surprising, but <laughs> like, oh, maybe I am quite funny, maybe. Um, yeah, I think, to be honest, at the beginning when I was writing it, when I started writing it, I was definitely uncomfortable about the idea of writing about myself. Um, uh, I found that uh, difficult and, and problematic. Um, it felt very self-indulgent and I, yeah, I didn't have the confidence that it was the right thing to do. So I think when I was doing it, the, the way I had to, to deal with it was to, was to laugh at myself. Um, and um, yeah, and I think that obviously comes out in the book that I am laughing at myself a lot and I hope that's a good thing. Um, but I think also kind of when I recall my, my memories of seaweed, Humour was such a huge part of my experience there. Um, there is so much heartbreak um, as for those of you who read the book, you'll know that. Um, and for those of you who, who are here talking, hearing Naina talk, um, yeah, you're surrounded by heartbreak and trauma the whole time. Um, and these animals who are so, some of them so lost and, um, and desolate. And so the way that many of us had to deal with it. And I think you often find this in other situations of trauma, like people who work in hospitals and that humor is a really valid and important um, uh, kind of strategy. And so when, for example, like I go out on a, um, with a session with Wyra and she'd be so um, upset and scared and angry. And if I kind of, if I took that on and was also upset and stressed out and nervous, then she would get worse. And so the way I had to deal with that was to, was to laugh about it and, and make jokes. And that in turn would calm me down and that would calm Wire down as well. Um, but also just generally things are very funny in the park. I mean, you're, you're exhausted, you come back at the end of the day, you wanna curl up in a corner and just cry and there's this monkey who's stolen all your bras. So <laughs> what oh, else can we yes. do to laugh about it? Um, so yeah, I think humor is really important because it, it helped me as a writer and it helps, I think it probably helps the reader to kind of, to manage all those kind of really uh, difficult issues. Yeah. Yeah. But the, and the, the pig, the naughty pig. The naughty pig, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Does it have a bra, bra right around its head at one point? A red lacy bra. Red lacy bra. <laughs> that's the first scene in the book, but anyway, that's my meeting, um, my welcoming committee when I get off the bus is the pig <laughs> and she's meeting me with, with a bra. <laughs> I think that um, talking about um, the pig kind of leads, leads on quite nicely into another question about why why it was that you chose that you, yeah, I think you probably agree that this is in large part a book about animals so I wanted to kind of ask you to talk a little bit about why why you wrote about animals yeah well I think I mean my experience was I went and I fell head over heels in love with these animals uh, predominantly with with Wyra um so I think I was when I started writing about it I was interested in what a book would look like if it wasn't a, if it was a love story not between two humans um, not between what we're often kind of fed that binary love story between a man and a woman what about a cross-species love story and could such a book be successful would anyone want to read about this girl and this puma um, and I think yeah when I had that realization that this kind of love exists and it's so important and can be so much more well for me it was so much more vibrant and, and rich than any kind of romantic love that I'd ever experienced um, so I think yeah these kinds of, of love stories are really really important um, but also I wanted I think I wanted to give space um, to to the characters to the to the jungle as a character and to the animals as characters when so often um, books, like love stories in particular, they're very human focused. And when we're so, at this time, um, when humans, some humans are 
uh, so fractured and, and separated from the natural world, um, me included, um, that I think, yeah, I think books like this are, stories like this are really important. Um, but the reality is in the end, it's not a book just about animals. Um, of course, it's about Wyra and it's about Coco and Faustino, but as Nana mentioned, uh, Siwi was never just a sanctuary for wild animals. It was always a place for people to, um, to come and to stand their ground. Um, uh, and I wanted that to be a part of the book. I wanted it to be about kin, about making kin. Um, but also I think the animals also give a way in um, to the bigger issues, to the, to the difficult issues which surround um, surround the sanctuaries. So deforestation, animal trafficking, climate change, forest fires. Um, when I was taught about these issues, it was often through the lens of a species as a whole. So humans as a whole or jaguars uh, or polar bears when talking about climate change. And I think the park and the people, humans and non-human who live there give you a way into something that's really hard to imagine when you just talk about numbers. Um, and I think it's a way of, of caring. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I was just thinking then you do want, there is a character in the book that's Patu, Patu I've always said it Patuju, but it's Patuhu. Patuhu, yeah. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't considered that that was a character, but it really is a, it really is a protagonist, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that leafy plant that you chew that grows so prolifically yeah and that's definitely like it's as much in everyday life in the in the park like that is a character yeah. you're interacting with this plant every day um and using it for so many different things um but it's also just there doing its thing um yeah and i hope i did kind of portray that in the book yeah it's lovely to hear about that than the more than human protagonists and, and company um, I think that leads us into a, 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 talking a little bit more about this this idea of empathy um, and your own journey <clears throat> as you, I'm sure people have, have, will have gathered from just from that short reading it's this kind of deepening journey into a state of empathy with the place and the creatures and many of the creatures and people very specifically um, Wyra so I just wondered about you talk, if you could talk a little bit about, about this decision to center empathy and make that such a key element of the book. Yeah, well, I think, I think Nana spoke about that too, um, how the park and Siwi is all about empathy. Like it, that's where it began with a few humans and a few monkeys looking for a different kind of future for themselves. Um, and I think some might say that a lot of what I write about in the book is anthropomorphic, um, and maybe it is, but firstly, I kind of think that's okay, but also I don't really like that word at all, um, as we've talked about Persephone. Um, I think it's just another way to claim that humans are better than animals, that humans, specifically white humans, um, have a higher capacity for feeling than others. Um, and at Siwi, I learned that that's wrong. Of course, wild animals need to be treated as wild animals. They're not pets and they think and feel very differently to how humans feel. Um, I have no idea what's going on in Wyra's brain most of the time, um, but that doesn't mean that they don't think and feel. And so empathy is what I learned at Siwi and it's what Wyra taught me. And so, yeah, that's why it's at, at the heart of the book. Thank you. Um, another key, another key, so it's that empathy is juxtaposed with this horrendous other kind of heart to the book, which um, uh, which takes which 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 happens in the in the form of this horrendous fire that you experience and that Lena alluded to. Um, and you also write uh, as the story progresses, we hear again and again about roads the agony of witnessing roads and animals dying on the roads and about clear cutting and the, as again, as Nana referenced, um, the disappearing forest. 
And I think that you've said to me in, in conversation in the past that living at seaweeds is, 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 is akin to being slammed, what well, is being slammed by apocalypse after apocalypse. So I'm quite interested in that, in that word apocalypse. And, and I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about how the love and the empathy helped you to navigate these kinds of apocalyptic horrors. Thank you for that question. Um, I think, yeah, when I arrived at Siwi, um, uh, I have been taught that there is only one apocalypse. Like the world, the world singular, um, can end only once. Um, and that's what we get taught in block, blockbuster movies and uh, all that kind of stuff. And so I thought for me, and I think I write about this when I talk about the fires, when there was a catastrophe, this massive disaster in my head, I was like, this is, this is the end. This is the end of seaweed. This is the end of us. But the reality is, and this is something that I learned over the years, is that seaweed has survived catastrophe after catastrophe. And that's what Nana said, like there's always a catastrophe. Um, and animals like Wyra have survived. For, I think, yeah, Wyra was taken out of the jungle when she was tiny. Um, and she was taken to the city, she had to survive that. The city was probably an apocalyptic landscape for her. And then she had to survive again when she brought, was brought to Siwi um, and had to recalibrate that in her brain, um, but she has survived. And for, for Wyra, I think her fear and her anger is so sharp that you can taste it when you're, when you're near her. But around that, there's always been um, the desire for love and companionship from her. And I've never met anyone who needs and craves love more than Wyra, nor who is more giving with their love. Um, so I think, yeah, each person here, I know there's quite a lot of people here who um, have lived at Siwi and who've experienced it and experienced their own journeys with, with animals like Wyra. Um, each one has their own story about how love has changed their lives and how the love um, for this community has enabled them to keep fighting and to keep surviving. So inspiring. These animals are so inspiring and the community at Siwi is so inspiring. So I've just got a couple more questions. Um, I'm not sure how much time we'll have left at the end for any audience questions and answers. I'm aware that someone in the audience is very anxious and wants to know how many scars you've got. <laughs> but I think we'll come to that at the end if we have a chance. Um, I wanted to ask what you, what it's a sort of technical, I don't know if it's a technical question. What was the hardest thing that you, you uh, for you about writing, writing the book? Um, okay, so I think at the when I, I've thought a lot about this because quite a lot of people have asked me. Um, and at the beginning, my answer was that it was definitely kind of finding the balance between telling my story and wires, along with the greater global context, which I've discussed. But actually, the reality, I've rethought my answer. And I think it was about having the confidence to do it and to actually write the book and to spend so much time writing about it. And I spent so many years being obsessed with the park and with Wyra and thinking that that was a bad thing. We're taught that obsession is a negative thing. Um, and I read this essay by Octavia E. Butler, who's an amazing sci-fi writer. Um, and it's about her kind of early life as a writer. And it talks about how you can form doubt um, into something life-changing um, and uh, how, yeah, that obsession can be a positive thing and it can, it can kind of change you as a person. And that's kind of what I realized is that that obsession with the park was a good thing. And write, spending all my time writing about Wire and drawing pictures of her and thinking about her, that wasn't a bad thing. And uh, I always used to say like, oh, the next time I go to the park, like this will be the last time, this will be the last time. It's never the last time. And that's okay. Like Siwi is like carved out a part of my heart and it's there and it will be there forever. It's part of who I am. So yeah, I think that was the hardest thing, like being able to, to write it and to put it out there with confidence. But I was so lucky with the support of people around me 
Um, and now I kind of, I see, I know that it was a good thing to write and people have responded so positively to it. So that's just amazing. Yeah, it's great that, that I, I love what you said. Thank you for sharing what you said then and, and at the beginning of our conversation about that sort of the self doubt or not, not, not wanting to take up space mm. and that you could kind of censor yourself to the point where you wouldn't go ahead with it because you didn't, those feelings of unworthiness, but actually once you can kind of get past that and just commit to the passion, commit to the positive obsession, you can really create something that has, makes real ripples. It was so lovely seeing Nana just saying <laughs> how the book could help them to finance the move to um, Hakuizi. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, I've got one more question for you, and it's obviously I, I have to ask this question as uh, as your as a, a long term um, Anka groupie and a devotee. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, setting up Anka, uh, which you did uh, after meeting um, the, the the people and the animals at um, Ambuari. I want you to tell me about setting it up and about your journey with Anka and how your relationship with series evolved as your relationship with Anka's evolved? So yeah so when I first came back from uh, Bolivia after being there for well being in South America for two years in 2009 the only thing I could do was write about the jungle and make art and yeah have that obsession um, and then I realized that that was a really kind of valid and amazing way to process um, all these kind of huge issues and emotions that I couldn't process otherwise. So I looked around to see if there was a, an art space or a gallery that um, was a space where people could come and, and address and talk about um, these sorts of stories about environmental justice. Um, and I couldn't find one in the UK. So with a huge amount of help from uh, lots of people, including Persephone, um, we set up Onka and uh, it was, yeah, the purpose was that it would be a place where people and artists and audiences could come and, and story share about these, these issues which were so important to them and that potentially it could also support organizations like Siwi. But I think when it started and when I started it, I thought because of what I've been taught, the best way to get people interested was through stories about animals. Um, and that's why I called it Onka, um, Panthera Onka after Jaguar. But I suppose, I think as I've learned both um, from Siwi and from the community that I've encountered around Onka, is that it doesn't work if you just tell the animal's story. Um, they don't exist in a vacuum. Um, uh, they're all part of this kind of entangled web of issues and stories. Um, and it's really important to tell all the stories and the human ones that run alongside and with the animal stories. Um, so yeah, I know that we're short on time, um, but I just, I hope I've kind of expressed that in the book and, and that's Onkas now as a space for, for addressing kind of environmental and social justice together. And that's, that's really, really important. Um, and I'm so proud of Onka and, and what it's become. It feels like a landmark event tonight. I just want to say I'm really savouring this conversation. I'm so happy. I feel like it's such a big deal to be here together. <laughs> I know that lots of your family and friends are here and long term supporters of Siwi and, um, you know, lots of lots of people and long term supporters of Onka and some of our trustees and things are here. So it's really it's a big deal today, June the 3rd, 2021. Yes, I just sort of want to honor you honor it and just say it's well done <laughs> <laughs> and on that i suppose it's a good moment to just kind of just plant a couple of little seeds about reminders about how people can help see we i know that nana touched on it earlier but do you want to quickly do a recap yeah so i guess kind of the main thing is or one of the main things is to stay in touch so you can go onto our website and sign up to the newsletter um and share the story, um, share what you've learned tonight, share what you um, have read about in the book. But I guess there's kind of, there's twofold um, things, twofold ways to help. So the first is to donate. 
Um, uh, we, as Nana said, like we need a huge amount of money to, for this move um, to Jacuzzi. Um, and so anything, um, people have already been so generous. And this last year over the pandemic, Siwi has um, kind of stayed alive with the, with the help and support of our international community, which has been absolutely incredible. Um, so yeah, any help that you can give, go, the most, like what's the most helpful are kind of recurring donations that kind of help with our, our daily funding. Um, yeah, so that helps kind of pay for the animals care, the animals food, um, and the day-to-day -day maintenance of everything in the in the sanctuaries. So yeah, sponsor an animal. Um, uh, Wire already has heaps of sponsors from the book, which is amazing. <laughs> she's an A-lister. That's what we're she's, she's total <laughs> princess A-lister. <laughs> <laughs> but there are loads of other animals on there who uh, could really do with sponsors. Um, so yeah, or just if you if that's too much, then just yeah, anything um, would be amazing. Um, and then the other side of it is when it's safe um, and when, if you feel kind of able to do it, then go out and volunteer. And if you can't go out and volunteer, just send us a message um, uh, and go on our website and send us an email or through social media and uh, tell us other ways that you can help. We're always looking for kind of fundraising support or yeah, anything like that. So yeah, volunteer in the park, volunteer globally outside the park and donate. And what's, the, what's the name of the US-based um, fundraising partner organization that Sarah helps run? Alberta, so the Bolivian uh, um, uh, Land Trust Alliance. B-A-L-T-A. -A. Yeah. Um, okay. And there's FIWI in the UK. Yeah, so Friends of Interwariasi in the UK, and there's also um, Friends of Interwariasi Australia. Um, uh, now it's one minute to the end of the event so I think probably I think probably the, there's only been we've got one question mainly in the uh, in the Q&A and I think probably it's um, I think that's just the one that we'll 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 answer and just say that if people want to um, ask anything else they can email info at onca.org.uk and we'll pass any questions on to you well we'll answer them or we'll pass them on to you or Naina or whoever's relevant um, Melanie Cairns has asked, how's your health now after all the extreme situations in Bolivia? You look great, but you must have scars. <laughs> uh, thank you for that question. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Um, it, you recover pretty quickly. Um, yeah. And uh, the on scar, one level. On one level, yeah. On an emotional level, you never recover. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I have a few few scars from the from the Bora Bora and the, and Wires Love Bites, but they're not not bad scars at all. And the kind of yeah, the main thing is kind of the effect it has on you as a person um, rather than physically. It just yeah, totally changed my life and changed the lives of so many other people. Um, yeah. <laughs> I want to go into I want to digress and talk about bot flies but <laughs> <laughs> um well thank you all for coming um yeah, there's just a few little congratulations in the Q&A um Terry Max says that they're so happy they stumbled across your book and Melanie Ken says it's an incredible landmark so um thank you for those questions and comments um I'm going to we're, we're going to play you out now aren't we yeah, yeah. we're going to play you out it's so exciting I love um, it. <laughs> yeah it's a micro love fest this is like the this is the edited highlights of the wire love fest isn't it oh uh, julie if you want to paste anything in the questions go ahead oh someone else has oh no uh alan says great job thanks okay we're gonna play you out so uh so can i just say quickly like yeah. thank you so much to everyone who has bought the book and yes has donated to see we because they've read the book like that is absolutely incredible and i'm just kind of so overwhelmed by the messages of support that i'm getting um and love for for wire and for for me which is amazing and for seaweed so that means so much and it definitely makes, makes it all worth it
Yeah, thank you for coming tonight, everybody. And thanks to those of you as well who, who gave some very generous donations um, uh, for this evening's event. Laura, have you got any other plans to talk about the book? Uh, not yet, but I will keep people updated. Yeah. Laura, maybe would you like to would you like to paste your preferred um, shop link into the chat so that people have got a link yes. to the to yeah. OK, well, many thanks all and many thanks, Laura. So lovely to be in conversation with you tonight. And thank you, Persephone, for hosting. Yeah. For hosting. It's our pleasure. I think quite a few of the team are here in the audience. <laughs> OK, right. There's no sound. Oh, should I put the sound on? Yeah, put the sound on. I love that when you just like put your arm across her arm. <laughs> I'll try and find the next one. I'll say that this was uh, when she first moved into her um, into a big enclosure. So this was her kind of exploring the trees. So it's all new to her. Yeah. Do you not like getting wet? She hates getting wet. <laughs> <laughs> so pretty. Oh. Shall I get the um? Shall I try and get the one of the monkeys? No. <laughs> I think we're done. Okay. <laughs> cool. Um. Yeah, so uh, Robin wants to know if it's on Kindle. It is on Kindle, yeah. Uh, and Connie says, can we get the recording? Yes, it will be on the Onka Arts YouTube channel, but we're going to subtitle it first, so it might take a while. Yeah, so how yeah. long will it take? I don't know, It's there's a capacity issue. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for your, thanks Kay for that lovely feedback. Kay says it's beautiful and brilliant. Kay and Chris Drury. And John Coleman says wonderful, brilliant. Okay. Well. <laughs>